Good morning, everyone. It's 9 30. Are we live here? Okay. Things okay. Welcome this morning. Uh, Chair Bailey is uh, not present today. Um, she is on the phone, though. Uh, she's uh, out of town and um, asked me to set in as uh, vice chair to chair this uh, committee this morning. I want to find out though from uh, do we have do we have a quorum? Um, so a roll call might be appropriate before we get into this, just so we'll know who is here and who is on the phone. So we'll start with those on the phone. Are there any members uh, on the phone this morning? Committee members. Commissioner King, this is Commissioner Bailey. I'm on the phone. Great, thank you. Any and others? Thank you for this meeting. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And Steve, Commissioner Solomon. Say again. Commissioner Solomon is here. Commissioner Solomon, thank you for joining us. Mr. Lazort, thank you. Commissioner Arana, thank you. Commissioner Anderson, thank you for joining us this morning. Commissioner Anderson's here. So the only one on the committee that's not present is uh, Commissioner Vandervaar. But we do have a quorum. Good. The uh, general statute 138A 15 mandates that the chairman inquire as to whether any member knows of a known conflict of interest or appearance of conflict with respect to matters before the commission. If any member knows of a conflict of interest or appearance of the conflict, please so say at this time. heard we we're okay with that the uh, approval of the minutes of the groundwater and waste management committee meeting May the 12th 2021 uh, that's been attached to the agenda I have all had a chance to read over that and if so could I entertain a motion that we approve the minutes I said we have to move the minutes Thank you, Commissioner Harada. Motion's been made. Second. All those approved. Should right in. Second, Susan. Thank you. Those of them approved. All, all in favor. Raise your hand. Thank you. That's unanimous. Oh, roll call vote. I apologize. I'm sorry. Got carried away. It's the first time back in about a year and a half from now. This, this is uh, we have one out there that uh, we'll we'll do that. Uh, Chair Bailey, um, are you okay with the minutes? Chair Bailey, the motion has been made to accept the minutes. Um, are you uh, voting yes to approve those minutes? Chair yes, Bailey. I am approving minutes. Chairman, uh, sorry, Commissioner Solomon? Yes. And then we have yes. um, Commissioner Rod? Yes. Commissioner Lazord. And I do also. Oh, Commissioner Anderson, thank you. <laughs> Commissioner Anderson also voted yes. So if unanimous. So we'll move on to the next, uh, we have a quorum. So the approval of amendments, we have one action item today. Uh, request approval to proceed to the MC to request public hearing on 15A NCAC 02L0100 is groundwater classification and standards, general considerations. The Division of Water Resources requests approval to proceed to the Environmental Management Commission for public hearing for proposed amendments to 15A NCAC 02L 
0.0100, the groundwater classifications and standards, general considerations. The purpose of the rulemaking is to incorporate changes required by Session Law 2018-114, Sections 19A through E and 19.1A through E, and Session Law 2020-74, Section 17.1A through E. The recommendation this morning is going to come from the division recommending that the GWWMC, the Groundwater and Waste Management Committee, approve the proposed amendments of 15A and CAC 202L.0100, the Groundwater Classification Standards General Considerations, to go to the full EMC for approval to proceed to public hearing. This morning we have with us uh, Rick Bullock, who is the section chief, followed by Eric Smith, who will now do a, pres a PowerPoint presentation for us. Thank you, Rick, for coming this morning and starting this off with a PowerPoint. Thank, thank you. you. And thank you to all the members of the committee for being here today. It's good to see actual people faces for the first time in such a long time. Uh, my name is Rick Bullock. I'm the groundwater resources section chief currently. And uh, myself, I'm going to start off, just give a brief introduction. Then Eric Smith, uh, who's also in the section, who's been doing the lion's share of the work on the readoption process, is going to speak for the majority of this presentation. So I just want to give you a brief overview of what we're doing today. Again, the purpose of this is to provide a little bit more in-depth summary of the proposed changes. Hopefully you all have seen uh, the handouts that included the red line versions of the proposed rules. Uh, we're also recommending some additional changes uh, that we've received uh, after the, we started the readoption process. Those changes are marked in red, and you'll see that during the presentation so that it helps distinguish that. So, um, we're also, in part of that, is also addressing some of the questions that were posed by the committee when we gave a uh, presentation on this as an information item during the last meeting. Uh, so, our, again, our goal is to ask the, the committee to proceed to the full EMC uh, with the proposed 2L rule draft readoption to proceed to public hearing. So again, this is this readoption process has been initiated as required by Session Law 2013-413 and General Statute 150B 21.3A. And so it's just for 15A NCAC 02L 0100 general considerations are only at this time. These rules provide the backbone of the groundwater protection program for the state of North Carolina. This is the crux of our, our main groundwater quality protection rules. So with this, I'm going to introduce Eric Smith again. He's been doing the lion's share of lifting. He's doing an excellent job. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Smith. I'm with the Division of Water Resources, and uh, I'll continue presentation from this point. Um, so as far as the actions to date are concerned, uh, an internal review by all affected divisions has been completed, along with an external review by interested parties, and that was completed in December of 2020. And this was sent to the standard DEQ stakeholder list, which includes governmental councils, industry, consultants, licensing boards, and environmental groups. And of all those people that we sent this to, uh, only three of these entities commented back. That was SCLC, Clean Water for NC, and the Division of Waste Management UST section. An RRC pre-review was completed in February 2021, and a regulatory impact analysis was approved in May 2021. And that is the only new item, uh, action item, that's occurred since our last committee meeting where we did present this as an informational item. Overall, with the uh, 200 rules, or excuse me, the 100 rules, uh, there's no major changes that are currently proposed, but when you look at the proposed rule, you're going to see a lot of red lines. Uh, but these revisions are, are generally reorganizations and uh, clarifications. No significant impacts were noted. This was both for the regulated community and the state. So we'll go through the, the, each of the sections and highlight some of the, the major changes uh, that we were proposing. Under definitions, we've added definitions for the following words for clarification. And most notably, we added the term waters of the state as defined in general statute to the definition of receptor. 
we don't consider this a significant change since this, all, this, since this has always been implied in the rules. Again, under definitions, we recommend deleting the following terms as they no longer appear in the text. And again, this is a recommendation that uh, this is a lower limit of quantitation, method detection limit, and time of travel. Under restricted designation, we've clarified that the restricted designation is a land use restriction rather than a groundwater classification because only the Environmental Management Commission can designate groundwater classifications. We specify that the designation is only for certain corrective action methods, and they include risk-based. In areas of remaining contamination after approved termination of active corrective action and where a variance has been granted. We also clarify what documentation will be required of an applicant. We clarified that the process, again under restricted designation, we clarified that the process for recordation, application, and removal of the restricted designation shall be in accordance with general statute. And we clarified that the RS can be removed that the groundwater is reclassified by the commission. Under the corrective action section 106, uh, there was major reorganization done here, but no substantial changes. And we also retitled this to be initial response, site assessment, and corrective action. And we did this for clarification purposes. With the reorganization, now the language in this section reads more like a step-by-step -step process and we then moved the monitoring and reporting rules out of this section into their own sections, 110 and 111, respectively. Again, under corrective action, we stated that the director may require modeling to determine if there will be a violation of groundwater standards at the compliance boundary. And this will be based on data trends, geologic and hydrogeologic conditions, and the spacing between the review and compliance boundaries. We clarified that the person may also choose to pursue risk-based remediation per general statute if applicable. We clarified that if a person requests to terminate active remediation prior to achieving the standards, they must demonstrate that natural attenuation will result in a return to the standards. Under compliance boundary, if we look back at the definition section, we introduced the concept of compliance zone and this is defined as the area between the compliance boundary and waste boundary. And this just helps define that area without having to make reference to the area within the compliance boundary as the rules currently do. It's sort of like calling your yard the area between the house and the fence. It's easier just to say the yard. We added that the compliance boundary shall remain in place for the duration of the permit because currently there is no specified time frame for the termination of the compliance boundary. So now, when the permit is rescinded or revoked, the compliance boundary will go away. We've allowed for multiple contiguous properties to be treated as a single property, and this is applied from the general statute, which postdates the rule. Under compliance boundary, we reworded the language to clarify that DEQ is not prohibiting the transfer of land within a compliance boundary for permitted facilities. Instead, we state what is required if the land is to be transferred, which is essentially a deed modification. And then under 107J, we deleted the prohibition of construction of new wells within the compliance boundary, as this is already in the rules in 107I. And again, under 107J, we deleted the rule that grants the right of the permittee in the state to enter the property, as this authority is already granted in general statute. Uh, again, under compliance boundary, and this is sim in 107K, which is similar to 107J, we made the same changes, except we added a clarification as to what is required for the termination of the easement. Currently, the rule states only that it may be terminated once its purpose has been fulfilled. So that's the term we clarified, once its purpose has been fulfilled. We added a timetable to report sales or transfers of property that affect the compliance boundary to the director. The current rule says immediately, the revised rule or proposed rule specifies reporting to the director within one week of the final sale or transfer. However, we recommend reporting that to seven days instead of one week because the term one week is ambiguous. Under 107 compliance boundary again, we recommend adding the following language for consistency. Uh, these general statutes were added to several other rules for clarification. 
For potential violations within the compliance boundary, we eliminated the exception for, five, for limestones within the coastal plain to make it general for all bedrock. Under 108 review boundary, we specified that if there is an exceedance of the standard at the review boundary, the person shall be required to take action per 106D. And now 106D states that the director may require the person to demonstrate that the exceedances won't occur at the compliance boundary. If those exceedances are predicted to occur, the person can submit a plan to prevent those exceedances. We provided specific items that the director may consider for requiring groundwater modeling and those considerations include, again, geological or hydrogeological conditions, data trends, and the spacing between the compliance boundary and review boundary. Under the monitoring section, 110, we've moved the monitoring requirements from 106 rule into this rule. We clarified that the director may require additional monitoring of any constituent of interest. For example, monitoring of a COI that could result from a geochemical change in the groundwater due to due to the presence of the system. We don't consider this a substantial change since it's already applied in the current rules. We deleted the requirement for placing wells, quote, one year's time of travel up gradient of a potential receptor and quote, no greater than the distance the groundwater at the contaminated site is predicted to travel in five years. And we've done this because of the variation in groundwater flow rates that can be anywhere from as little as a few centimeters per year up to as much as a few feet per day. Again, under monitoring, we added monitoring systems, that is, wells, seepage meters, shall be able to detect if a groundwater contaminant plume is causing or contributing to surface water standard exceedances. Now, a system such as this would not be required unless it is determined that contaminated groundwater is, in fact, discharging into a surface water body. However, under the same rule, we do recommend modifying it before going to the full MSC and the revisions shown below in red and underlined, we feel that these revisions will help clarify the rule even more. Again, under monitoring, we clarified the time frame for terminating the monitoring programs, and that is if concentrations are at or below the standards for four consecutive quarters, the director may issue a no further action letter depending on the data trends. Under 111 reports section, again, we moved the reporting requirements from the 106 rule into this own separate rule here. Then we added some specific items to what is required in site assessment reports and corrective action plans. These are items that are deemed necessary for complete and thorough reports, and they allow for easier evaluation by DWR staff or any staff. And we should note that these items are generally provided by consultants when preparing these types of reports and plans although they are not currently specified in rule, and that's why we don't consider this a substantial change either. Under 112 analytical procedures, we refer directly to the 2H rule, which is the rule for laboratory procedures, analytical methods, sample preservation, sample containers, and sample holding times. And by referring to the 2H rule directly, that way our rules will stay current. And I should point out that there have been no, there's no major changes to the other rules after that. So what we'd like to do now is look, we would like to respond to some of the questions that were asked during the last committee meeting that were asked by the commission members. So the one question we had was regarding monitoring wells used to detect contamination causing or contributing to surface water exceedances. And again, our response to this would be that monitoring wells or systems for detecting groundwater discharges into surface water would be required if a groundwater containment plume was determined to be discharging to a surface water body. That is, DEQ would not require this type of monitoring unless the site was in some stage of corrective action. There was a question regarding record implementation versus 2L corrective action, and if there was any infringement. And our response is no, and that's based on Division of Waste Management interpretation. There was a question regarding the fiscal note time frame, and at the time of the last committee meeting, it was not finalized, but since then, the fiscal note was finalized in May 2021, and we submitted that to the committee. There's a question regarding whether draft rules were seen by external stakeholders, 
and our response was yes, these draft rules that we're presenting to the committee are nearly identical to those that are seen by external stakeholders, and they also contain some of their comments. There was a question regarding the UST section comments on surface water. Uh, our response was yes, the UST section did ask about why groundwater standards and private supply wells are more stringent than surface water standards, that is in public drinking water wells. And our response is this is because the standards for groundwater are determined by the requirements specified in 2L.0200. There was a question regarding the average length of time that an RS designation, restrictor designation was in place. And uh, based on our research, we could find that the RS designation was only ever used once. It was applied to in the Asheville region to a former gas station in 1992. And as far as we can tell, it has not yet been removed. And finally, there was a question regarding the public notice provision for recording a restricted designation. And the response is that the proposed rule 2L0104H states that the division shall provide public notice prior to approving the RS designation and also provides a process for that notice. So with the readoption timelines, uh, the finalized, we finalized the fiscal note that was completed. Uh, the RRC pre-review was completed. We're here before you today to ask for approval to proceed to the full EMC. That meeting would occur in September of this year. And with the rest of the, the stuff that has to go on after that, the time frames are going to be really tight, but we need to get these rules hopefully effective before November of 2022. So with that, the Division of Water Resources respectfully ask this committee for permission to take the draft 2L0100 rules to the full EMC for approval to proceed to public hearings. And we also ask that that includes the recommended changes that we have included in this presentation. So with that, uh, if you have any questions for us, um, our contact information is here. Myself and Rick Bullock will be available to answer any questions. Is it my understanding that you want to take this tomorrow or you want to do it in September? In September, sir. Gotcha. Thanks, Eric. Yes, sir. Thank you again, too, Rick. And step out. I'm sorry, but thank you. We've got a recommendation from the division uh, that uh, they ask that uh, this committee approve this to go forward to the EMC uh, board in September. Any questions? Commissioner? I have one question that I don't think came up before. For the hydrogeological information, would an applicant or the director be able to use existing studies or would a site-specific study be required? The consultant could uh, provide information that's done in a site assessment for the site-specific or they could offer uh, regional information as well. Okay, would it just be up to the discretion of the director to specify what, which type of information? Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Chairman Bailey, do you have any questions? Commissioner Solomon? Here, okay. If not, then we'll just go ahead and call for uh, a vote. And um, does everyone understand the motion? So, if uh, there's a motion from the floor, Commissioner Rada? I will move to approve the 2L.0100 rule set to go to the full commission for consideration in September. Okay, second. Any second? Can you just 
that would be fine to include include the changes. Right, my motion was to include the uh, language as presented today. Okay. Second. Commissioner Resort seconded. Any uh, discussion on the motion? If not, we'll call for a vote. We'll start on the phone with um, Chairman Bailey. Chairman Bailey, Commissioner Solomon, Commissioner Solomon. Yes, hello. Uh, yes. Okay. We're voting on the motion. Yes. Commissioner Absolutely. Anderson. Commissioner Arata. Yes. Commissioner Lazor. Yes. And I as well. Let's see, unanimous. Uh, other than uh, half Chairman Bailey not voting. Thank you for that presentation. Thank you for the committee and putting this together in a motion in a way that it goes to the EMC in September um, for uh, proposed amendments. Okay, thank you for your consideration. Say again? Thank you for your consideration. Yes, sir. Well, that's our only action item this morning. And uh, thanks again for the staff and putting that together. So uh, any closing remarks from the committee from the committee? Commissioner Dear Hagley, thank you for coming today. And um, Commissioner Harris, thank you for sitting in today. No further uh, comments uh, from the commission. I would like to um, just mention that these proposed uh, amendments and um, some adoptions to the rules and readoptions are, are, are coming up uh, in September and November just to let the committee know in advance that proposed amendment for 15A NCAC 13A rule 0119 to add the photo uh, Voltaic modules as a universal waste under a division of waste management. Um, proposed amendments for 15A and CAC 13A to clarify hazardous waste requirements. Again, uh, the division of, uh, of waste management. Proposed adoption uh, for new rules 15A and CAC 13B. 2000 for CCR landfills. Again, uh, the, uh, the Division of uh, Waste Management. And proposed readoption uh, for uh, of the 15A NCAC O2P leaking petroleum underground storage tank cleanup funds. Uh, that will also um, be for, uh, the Division of Waste Management, but under the uh, under, underground storage tank. So those are just some notes uh, for our upcoming September and November. Uh, thanks again for being here today, and we'll start up the next committee meeting uh, here shortly. I'm not sure which one that is. It's air quality. Air quality, and what time would you like to start that? It's scheduled for 10.45, and we're still missing a couple folks. We have a quorum. I believe we're good to go after 15 minutes after this meeting. Okay, we will adjourn this. We will adjourn this uh, committee meeting uh, of the uh, waste management and uh, the uh, groundwater and waste management committee, and we'll take a 15-minute break. Or do I need a motion that we adjourn? Is everybody in agreement with that? I think we're good. Okay, well, I declare this committee meeting over, and those who are here for the next meeting will start in 15 minutes, 10.15. Thank you.
No, you can just, you can just get, yeah, you can just get here from the parking lot. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Uh, I know. <laughs> Great. Have fun. <laughs> but it's good to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. So, yeah. Take
Yeah, I, I downloaded what was on the um, on the air quality agenda just just in case the people for the air quality meeting don't, don't get here in time. Thank you. 